pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come before Thee, thanking Thee for this opportunity that Thou has given us, and the blessings of this day that we've enjoyed, and to see Thy glory throughout all the day, and the beauty of it. We're thankful for this opportunity that we have to, for those who love Thee, to assemble in Thy midst, and to proclaim Thy love for Thee, and to show Thy respect for for Christ who came to this earth and gave his life for us that we may have a chance of home in heaven with thee. We pray for all the members of this congregation, dear Lord, that have come, who assembled here. We, thou know us, every one of us, and every one of us private struggles that we go through, and we ask thee for strength to be the example that we should in this life. We pray for our families, dear Lord, and for those who are falling away from thy word and have returned back to the temptations of this world. We pray for wisdom, for the words that we can say that would open their eyes that they once again will return to thee. And for all of us who have talents of this congregation, Dear Lord, we pray that we can use them to the elders of the, whatever that they need for us to do. We pray for their wisdom to look to thee for guidance in this congregation. And we just pray, dear Lord, that we, we all can be the examples to each other in love that we should show. At this time, we're mindful of our missionaries off in foreign fields who struggle to proclaim thy word we pray that they can continue to get the support that they need to spread thy kingdom for all the lost of this world dear lord who are entangled in satan's snares of differential beliefs and and the waywardness of life and the temptations of life and let's see the the examples of this world that they are more inclined to live instead of after thy word and we just pray that thou will be with the, them and open their eyes to, that they may come to the truth. We're mindful of our government at this time, dear Lord, as, as the confusion and, and the lack of moral guidance that we have in this country we pray dear Lord that we can elect leaders who are more inclined to thy word that we can once again be known as a God fearing country we pray for our first responders and our soldiers who are often foreign fields and in the wages of war here in our street we ask thy that that will be with them, protect them. And dear Lord, we just pray for this country and that we can continue to be steadfast and unmovable as Christians as we ought, regardless of what this world does and where our leaders lead us. We know that we're always looking to thee for our strength and we pray that we can be thine example. We pray for Brother Carter as he stands before us tonight that thou will give him a ready recollection of those things that he is prepared to say and that we can take them and apply them to thy lives and be the Christians that we ought. We pray that we'll go through the further portion of this service and may all things be done and according to thy will. In Christ's name, amen. For Brother Allen's message this evening, which we have all looked forward to hearing, we'll sing, not that song. We'll sing Wonderful Story of Love. <clears throat> Let us sing. Wonderful story of love, tell it to me.
Good evening, everyone. I want to thank you all for giving me this opportunity to be up here tonight to speak to you. I think it is a great thing that New Year's Day decided to fall on a Sunday this year because we all get to spend it with each other and we get to spend it with God's people. And I have the unique opportunity to be the second sermon you have heard in the year 2023. So hopefully it's a good one and you don't throw tomatoes at me as I go out the door, but let's hope that it's a good one. This new year, for many people, is a year of new beginnings. We all know the classic thing where people decide to have their New Year's resolutions to maybe get back in the gym, to start eating better, to start focusing on different things in their life more than other things. But for the beginning of the year, it seems, for the first couple of weeks, everyone wants to start anew. They want to try something new, do something new, be something new. This past January, so in 2022, the beginning of January, I decided to do one of those things and I decided to start going back to the gym with the mindset of losing weight. A year later, almost a year later, it would be next couple weeks, um, I have been going to the gym consistently, eating better, trying to better myself physically, and I have lost 35 pounds. It's been a very difficult and very challenging at times journey as I've decided to be consistent and be vigilant in my exercise and what I eat and what I do on a daily basis to better myself physically. Now, looking back at my life, this is probably one of the greatest transformations and commitments that I've ever made for myself. However, there was one transformation in particular that was greater than any other transformation I could possibly ever make for the future of my life. The year was 2016. I was at church camp in Bandina, Texas, or actually in Bandera, Texas. The camp was Camp Bandina. And the preacher had just finished a sermon about being lost. He had told this story about a woman who went hiking somewhere in Colorado and she got lost on the trail. And many days later, she died. But the thing was, she died only a couple miles away from a major highway and a major road where she could have had rescue. And he compared that story to sometimes as Christians, we get so close to salvation, but we just don't quite get there. And he offered the invitation and just God was working on my soul that night. And I made the decision to be baptized on that night in that summer at that particular church camp in that particular year. And it would change my life for forever. On that night, I became a member of the church and I became a Christian and my life was begun new and ultimately would affect my eternal destination as well. Like many here, I made that decision to have a new beginning for my life spiritually. I was no longer going to live for myself. I made the decision to no longer live for myself, but I made the decision to give my life to God. I had a clean slate to begin anew and to live differently than I was before. When thinking about new beginnings, there's a verse that comes to my mind, and that's Romans chapter 12. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 12. In Romans 12, Paul's talking about being a living sacrifice, and he's talking about being transformed and being different from the world. He starts by saying in verse 1 of chapter 12, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves or to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be transformed to this world, or do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. When I read this verse, a few things come to mind. One of those being that as a Christian, we are to look different than the world around us. The Apostle Paul makes it clear that if we are to be a Christian, that, and if we are to be acceptable to God, that we cannot look like the world. We cannot conform to the world. But instead, we have to be transformed. And we are transformed by the renewal of our mind. And ultimately, that renewal of the mind can only happen because of Jesus. You can only have your mind changed, your actions changed, and the way you live changed by giving your life to Jesus. And that's the decision that we all made when we decide to be baptized. We decided to no longer look like the world, to no longer live like the world, but to live for Jesus, to choose to be transformed. 
you take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, it tells us exactly how are we it tells us exactly how we are born again into a new life in verse 3. 1 Peter 1, 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That verse makes it clear that it is only by the power of Jesus and by the power of God that we can begin to be transformed and have a new life and to have a new beginning. It's Jesus, the one who caused us to be born again. It's Jesus who caused us to have a hope in salvation, to have hope in the resurrection. See, the thing is, many people don't realize that we can't do this by ourselves. There's no way we ourselves can work hard enough and do enough work to get to heaven. That's not what the Bible teaches. It's only by God's grace and mercy that we are able to make it to heaven. It's only by Jesus that we can have a new life. See, this change, it's not an instant change. It's not something that happens overnight, and it's not something that we can do by a one-time decision, by being baptized. It's a lifelong journey. See, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 24, it tells us this, if you would like to turn there. 1 Corinthians 9, starting in verse 24. In 1 Corinthians 9, 24, Paul writes this to the Corinthian church. He says, Do you not know that in a race... All the runners run, but only one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain it. And every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and I keep it under control. Lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. See, even the great apostle Paul needed to constantly discipline his body. He, like an athlete, had to every day practice what he preached. And that's the same thing we as Christians have to do if we are to live a transformed life. We can't just make that one-time decision to be baptized and think we're good to go for the rest of our life. We have to make the decision every day to be different, to be different than the world, and to live our life for Jesus. Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 25, shed some light on this. If you would like to turn there, Luke 9, 23 through 25. Here Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and as he's talking to his disciples, he tells them what they want to hear, or he tells them the qualifications of someone that wants to follow him. And he says in verse 23 of chapter 9, he says, And he said to all, all being the apostles, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world um, and loses or forfeits himself? If we are to be a new creation, if we are to be Christians, if we are to have a different life and one that lives for God, we have to deny ourselves. Not only once when we are baptized, but like Jesus says to his apostles here and those who all follow him, he says, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. If we are to be transformed, if we are to have this new life, we have to let go of living for ourselves. We have to let go of doing what we want to do. Because when we made that decision to be baptized, to be transformed, and to live a new life, we gave our life to God. And we, in that action, said to God that our life is now yours, God. And if we did that, if we made that commitment, then we no longer live for ourselves. We have to deny ourselves daily and constantly. And we have to pick up that cross and continually commit ourselves to God. When I look at this verse, I think about what the cross meant. In that time, people would look at the cross and they would see a symbol of suffering, a symbol of shame, a symbol of something that's to be feared. And Jesus told his disciples, if you're going to follow me, that's the symbol you have to bear. That's the burden you have to bear. You have to bear the cross daily. You have to commit to following me daily. You have to daily say, I don't live for myself anymore, but I live for Christ. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 16 and 17. 
In 2 Corinthians 5, 16 and 17, Paul writes this to the Corinthian church. He says, From now on, therefore, regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. See, we are a new creation, and if we are a new creation, we have to put away our old self. We have to put away the way, the way that we acted, the way we talked, the way we interacted with people when we were not Christians, when we were not baptized. But now that we are a new creation, now that we are baptized, we have to be different. We have to have that new beginning, and we have to be different to people and to each other and the way that we act. See, what becomes clear is that it's impossible to have a new beginning spiritually and in life without Jesus. It's impossible to be transformed without Jesus and without constant daily discipline and renewal of one's mind and actions because we're a new creation. I firmly believe that in order to fully begin to transform and to renew ourselves and to become different from our old selves is that we have to fully surrender our lives to God and to his word. This is not a one-time thing like baptism, because at baptism, we didn't just make a decision that, that would last for eternity. We made a decision and a commitment that would last to eternity. That commitment is to God and to living for him. Often I see too many Christians, after they are baptized or after they've been in Christ a long time, they look at the Bible and they interpret the Bible in a way that they think the Bible should say. A way, that they, uh, a way that fits their lifestyle. They look at the Bible and they point a description and they say, no, 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 that's not what it means. This is what I can do. This is how I should act because that's what fits my lifestyle the best. That's what fits how I want to be treated and how I want to treat people the best, whether it be right or whether it be wrong. I, I, I firmly believe that if you're to be a Christian that is fully surrendering to God, you must read the Bible and let the Bible speak for itself. You cannot tell the Bible what it should say, or tell the Bible what it means, or make the Bible fit to your lifestyle. That's not how it works when we are baptized, and that's not how it should have worked when we decided to commit to God. Because if you read about that, it's all about surrendering, giving our lives to God. Because in that moment in time, we need to live to what the Bible says. That's the commitment we made. The Bible becomes what we need to live by. Not what I think the Bible should say, but what the Bible says. That's how we should live. And that's how we should conduct ourselves. That's how we should view the world through the Bible. Because, you know, you have many people that view the world through different lenses, whether it be through what they were taught by their parents, taught through school, taught by the government, taught by the culture. It doesn't matter. If we made the commitment to be baptized and to be a member of the Lord's church, we no longer live by ourselves. We live by what the Bible says, and we live by God. There are is this particular story that comes to mind when I think about these things. See, sometimes people, I feel, uh, Christians I mean, I, I see many Christians that want to live so close to the world, but yet try to live so close to God that they have one foot in the world and one foot in Christ, and that just doesn't work. There's, there, this story comes to my mind. There once was this village, and in this village, there lived many, many people, thousands, million, however many people you want to imagine. There lived many people. And around this village was a fence. And beyond the fence, it was just fog. They couldn't see anything. And, you know, life in the village was not too bad. Everything was okay. People were fed sometimes. Sometimes they went a little hungry. People had enough to drink, and sometimes they didn't. You could be successful in the village, but sometimes it would not be so successful. Things were just okay. And then one day, this mysterious man appears on the other side of the fence. And see, while he's on the other side of the fence, he's telling all the people who can hear him that he knows of a far-off place where you'll never go hungry, you'll never thirst, you'll never die again, and it will just be the greatest thing in the world. But the only way that you can get to this far-off place is if you hop the fence and follow that man. For You can only get to that place through that man. That's the only way it'll work. And after this man had told this story... Many jumped the fence, but many also stayed. But there was also a select few people that stayed on the fence because they were unsure whether to go over or to stay. But the man made one stipulation. He said, I'm only coming back one more time at an undisclosed time. And when I do come back, this will be the last time I come back. And if you're with me, you're with me. And if you're not, 
you're not. So then the man left with the people that decided to hop the fence with him. And then one day he came back many, many years, however long later, and he told the same story. And many people decided to once again jump the fence, but many people also decided to stay back, and many people decided to stay on the fence. See, the thing about this story is the man, the mysterious man, is Jesus. That village is the world. The people in it are us. And Jesus came to this world, and he offered a place for us to be that where we wouldn't die, we would never hunger, we'd never thirst. And he said, I'm only coming back one more time. And after that, that's it. And see, the thing is, there are too many people on the fence. There's too many people living in the world and too many people on the fence. And the thing is, you have to make a decision because guess who owns the fence? Satan owns the fence. You have to either be all in or all out when it comes to Jesus. You see, when you think about being transformed, you can't just be half transformed. That's not what transformed means. Transformed is when you're completely something different than you were before. So if we're to be Christians, we can't have one foot in the world and one foot in God. We have to be all in or all out. We have to let God work in our life. We have to let God's word work in our lives, and we have to submit to God if we want to be transformed. One thing that bothers me the most, and it's bothered me a lot lately because I've seen it happen a lot, is that Christians, faithful, faithful Christians, people that want nothing but good for their lives and want nothing but good for the world, they let tradition get in the way of the truth of the word. They let tradition get in the way of reaching people and giving them the love of God. See, the Pharisees, they struggled with letting tradition get in the way of the truth that Jesus was giving them, the love that Jesus was giving them. Turn to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. In Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 through 9, Jesus is dealing with the Pharisees in this particular situation. And uh, verse 1, it says, Then the Pharisees and the scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. And they answer them, And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, If anyone tells us father or his mother, What would you have gained from me is given to God. He need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have void the word of God. You hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. There's one thing I'm worried about as a Christian. It's that sometimes some people will give you a tradition and they will say, this is the rule. This is how it's always been. This is how it's always going to be. But God tells us that sometimes tradition is wrong. Sometimes the way that we've always done things is wrong. And that's why when I say that we have to fully surrender our lives to God, that what I mean by that is sometimes what I think and how I think things should be is sometimes not the, the way things should be and sometimes not the way that God wants things to be. So that's why it's up to us as Christians to be students of his word to discipline ourselves daily and to listen to what God has to say daily so that we do not fall in the same trap as the Pharisees did in putting tradition over truth. As Christians, if we want this new beginning, if we want to be transformed, I think the one tell should be how we interact with people, how we are viewed by the people of the world. Because if, like Jesus, when people looked at Jesus and his apostles, they immediately knew that they were different. They immediately knew that there was something different about them and the way that they acted, the way that they talked, the way that they treated people, because it was different than anything that had ever been seen in the world. The same goes for us as Christians. If we're to live a transformed life, we have to look different than the world. Turn with me to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. In John chapter 17, starting in verse 14, it says this, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. 
I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. For their sake, I consecrate myself, and they also may be sanctified in truth. See, the thing is, we may be in the world, but we have a higher calling than th what this world has to offer. God came down in the form of Jesus, and he offered us something that is way higher than anything this world could ever give. And when we chose to make that decision to become Christians, we chose that life. We chose to be set apart from the world because of God's word. We chose to be set apart from the world because of God's truth. So we have to be different if we are to be God's people. We have to be different. As Christians, I think it's also important to remember that uh, we, we can't continually be like the world. We can't continually choose to sin and choose to live that lifestyle we lived before being baptized because then that just foregoes the commitment we made when we chose to be baptized. This is made clearer by when Paul was writing to the Romans in Romans chapter 6. If you would like to turn there, Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. Paul writes there, he says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized in his death? We are buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. I would like to highlight that part that in the uh, end of verse 4. It says that we too might walk in newness of life. See, the thing is, what good does it do if we decide to walk in a new life if we continue to live like the old life? If we continue to sin, continue to live like we used to, what good does that do for the sacrifice that Jesus made? It it totally spits in its face. It rubs dirt in its face. We're basically telling Jesus that his sacrifice was for nothing if we choose not to be different. I think that in order to be transformed, like I mentioned earlier, we have to be different in the world. And one thing that I think that would help people to realize that we are different is in the way that we treat people and in the way that we view the world. See, personally, I struggle with doing that sometimes. I myself, like hopefully many of you, love God's word and love God. And it's hard for me at times to watch people in the world blatantly spit and just trample all over God's word. You know, I think about the people of the, the homosexual community, people that promote ungodliness and they call it good. And they call it love and they call it all these things. It makes me angry. It makes me upset because I know it's wrong, because I know that it's spitting in the face of God and it's sin. But the thing that I think about is the fact that when I think about where the anger is coming from, I realize sometimes that I'm angry at the person and not the sin. And, and that's at times where I have to check myself and I have to say, you know what, that's not right. It's not right for me to be angry at that person because they don't know. They don't know God's word. And, and I have no right to be angry at them because at one point in my life, I was just like that person. I was a sinner who was lost. I was a sinner who didn't have God's truth in his heart. And, and God had enough grace and mercy to die on that cross for me, just as much as he had enough grace and mercy to die on that cross for that person. So I have no right to be angry at that person. I have every right to be angry at the sin and every right to be angry at the fact that the devil is working in this world but I have no right to be angry at that person. There is one passage that I, I think about when I think about how we should view people. And, and that comes from one of my favorite stories in all the Gospels, and that's the feeding of the 5,000 people. And one of those um, scriptures is from Mark chapter 6, if you'd like to turn there. Mark chapter 6. And I like this passage from Mark because here in Mark, there, there's one little blurb that is not really expanded upon in the other Gospels. In Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 26, or, well, that's, okay. Yeah, verse 26. Uh, no, it is not verse 26. I put that wrong in my notes. Not in 26. Starting in verse 30. In verse 30, it says, The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place to rest for a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. 
And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. And when he went ashore, he saw the great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. The reason why I like this passage so much is because there's this whole setup before this, this little blurb in, uh, in verse 34. Jesus and the apostles had no downtime. They had no time to relax. They had no time to enjoy themselves. It seems they went across, and here's all these people, once again, that Jesus has to teach to, Jesus has to minister to. These people from different backgrounds, different walks of life, different beliefs, different everything. And the first thing that Jesus, the first thought that he had was compassion. And that's the thing I have to remember when I see these people that are of the world. I have to have compassion for them. If I'm to be different than the world, and if they're different from me, that's okay. Because guess what? They're a sheep without a shepherd. They're, they're people out there without Jesus. And it's not right for me to be angry. What is right for me to do is to have compassion for those people if I'm to be different. If we're to be different as Christians, we have to have love. We have to have compassion for these people if we're to be different. We must also remember John chapter 3, verse 17, and John chapter 12, verse 47. And both of those verses, they, they say basically the same thing, which is that Jesus did not come into this world to condemn the world, but he came to this world to save it. And if Jesus came to do that, then that goes for us as well. If we're to be followers of Christ, our purpose in this world is to not condemn people. God's word will do that if their hearts are open to it. It will condemn them and force them to change their life if they're open for it. It's not our job to condemn people. Our job is to show them God's love. Our job is to show them the right way. Our God is to show them the new life and the hope and the amazing joy they can have in Jesus. And the thing that I also remember when thinking about this is Romans chapter 3, verse 23, where it says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're all sinners, whether we realize it or not. The only difference between the people of the world and us is the fact that we have Jesus as our shepherd, but they are lost sheep. They're people without a shepherd. But it only takes one of us, it only takes a few of us to show them God's love. That's all it takes. But we can't do that if we look exactly like them. We can't do that if we act, talk, and have the same thoughts and feelings as them. We can only show people a better way and a better life if we ourselves are transformed. One last verse, and then the lesson will be yours. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 3. Matthew chapter 7, in verse 3, it says this, Why do you seek, or why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is a log in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. See, Jesus taught the same exact lesson. We all have our own sin to deal with. We all have our own problems. How dare we point out other people's problems and condemn them for their problems when we ourselves sin as well? We need to remember to be different than the world. We need to remember to commit to God daily. We need to remember to deny ourselves daily and pick up that cross. And we need to be a light to those in the world. We don't need to put them down. We don't need to act like we're better than them. We don't need to condemn them for what they are doing because God's word will do that. Our job is to show them a better life. Our job is to show them God's love. And we can do that only if you're transformed and only if you have that decision to have a new life. Um, at this time, if anyone has any need or has faltered on their commitment to God, uh, do so now as we come and we have our song.
be seated. Is there anyone that was unable to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning? Is there anyone that like to contribute to the work of the church tonight? Our closing song tonight will be This Is The Day. We will have an elder coming forward to lead our closing prayer in just a minute, but let me just say, Carter, not Caleb, Carter, that was an excellent lesson. Any lesson that points us back to the Word of God first day of the year or any day of the year is right on target. Thank you so much for coming and sharing that with us. Our closing song and then we'll have a, a wrap up prayer. Let us sing. Ooh,